Welcome everyone, good day, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you who are joining us for today's session. We are about to close this year, 2022, but before we close it, we would like to bring to you this special topic calling uh, implementing umbrella sign. So before we get started, I would like to share with you just a couple of news and upcoming events or related information that is from your interest that we have in the community. First of all, I would like to invite you, we create a special series of content of interviews about the VIP ladies that we have in our community. All of them have a great story behind. Um, it's not because I'm a lady, but seriously, you learn a lot from them. So I invite you to have a look to these interviews. I'm gonna place the link on the chat. We started with Marine Mahoney, Katie New, and Stephanie Kinop. Also, we'd like to invite you to become an event top contributor. Remember that every time that you provide replies, you share documentation, comments, you create information videos, you can get the chance to become someone who is giving a lot to the community. And that works out in this way. Every time you see any kind of content, it can be a reply, it can be a document, it can be a video. If you give a helpful vote, uh, as you can see on the screen, it looks like a tiny star. That can help us out to identify not only the quality content that is in the community, but also that we can find it out easier. For instance, if you make a question in the community and someone answers it properly, and if you click it in accept that solution, in future, every time that someone is looking for the same question or the same answer, you will be able to find it easier. And well, just to get started, I would like to introduce you to the panel. Um, just as a small detail, all of them are joining us from Costa Rica today, so welcome, guys. I'm not going to give all the biographies from them, but I would like to uh, pass on the microphone to each of them so they can introduce. So let's get started from left to right. So, Eduardo, uh, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Hilda. I'm doing fine, thank you. Thank you. Can you let us know a bit more about, like, um, where you are and what's your role in Cisco? Uh, sure, sure, no problem. So I'm based in Costa Rica and I'm part of the Umbrella SDM team. I'm currently the technical leader for the team. So um, <clears throat> I'm in charge of uh, the team and I assist them on deploying Umbrella to all our new customers. So we're post-sales uh, engagement for our customers. Great, thank you very much. And I would like to welcome Luis, which is actually sit next to, to Eduardo. Welcome, Luis. Good day. And can you let us know more about you, please? Sure. Uh, so as you can see, my name is Luis Silva. Um, I'm a customer success specialist. I'm based in Dallas, but today I'm visiting uh, Costa Rica. Happy to be here. Uh, well, I've been working for Cisco for almost, well, probably around 13 years, and uh, we'll be helping uh, the team with the, with the demo. So. Um, more than glad to share all what we have in regards to Umbrella and so you can learn a little bit more about it. Thank you very much, Luis. And lastly, but not least, uh, Ivan, welcome to this event. And can you share more about you, please? Definitely. Hi, Ilva, and thank you everyone for, for attending to this session. And we hope uh, you can learn, learn a lot about the product. Um, I'm a service delivery manager, and same as Eduardo. I work uh, helping our customers to get uh, Cisco Umbrella deployed after uh, they purchase their subscription, right? To make sure they get a successful implementation and guide them through that process. So happy to be here and share the knowledge that, that we have been able to get through this uh, uh, process. Thank you very much, guys. And well, now you know more about our experts, and I would like to let you know that if you would like to have a deeper look to all the slides and the information that these experts are sharing with us today. Uh, we have this, um, these slides and this presentation in the community. So just give me a couple of minutes and I will share the link in the chat panel as well so you can have a deeper look to that information. And finally, please uh, remember that this is an interactive session, so don't feel shy. Uh, this is a great moment. You have all the great experts here, as you have heard. You can submit your questions at the Q&A panel. It is usually located at the right side of your screen. And if you're on a mobile device, it appears on the tiny spheres there. Uh, if you have other questions or you are having issues with this session or WebEx, please try to use the chat. Also, if you would like to have uh, more information or I would like to get a presentation, any other kind, let's try to use it in the chat. And well, just to start this, 
let me share the presenter's privileges with Ivan so he can start with this. Thank you. Again, as Ilva mentioned at the beginning, today we'll be presenting um, a topic, really good topic about implementing Umbrella SIG. Uh, and uh, we hope you guys get the best out of um, this, this uh, topic. And again, feel free to ask any questions you might have uh, on the chat. This is a, a brief um, explanation about the agenda of what we will be presented with today. Uh, we'll have a SIG deployment overview so you can see uh, the different deployment methods that you can implement in your network to leverage the Umbrella SIG deployment. Um, we will be talking a little bit about the best practices. Um, we'll also be going through the considerations uh, that you will need to take um, when you're implementing Umbrella. We'll have some slides also to talk about the troubleshooting steps that you could take um, in case you need to do any, any you face any issues and you will need to um, get more details about uh, what's going on, then you can you can get some, some details about that. And at the end, we'll have a, a demo so you can see a live um, configuration and, and, and walkthrough of the Umbrella dashboard and the different things you can get out of the product. So initially, we want to start with an overview of the deployments. Uh, as some of you might know, the um, Umbrella subscription, is, it contains three layers of security or three layers of protection. These are divided into three key features. The, initial, the first one, as you can see on the left-hand side, is DNS, um, with, with con which contains different deployment methods like configuring your local DNS servers to send traffic to Umbrella. Uh, you can also implement virtual appliances. We have uh, API integrations, any connect for roaming users or the standalone roaming client. And um, all of them are basically in, used to make sure you get your DNS traffic sent to Umbrella. And um, depending on the on which of these components you implement, the better visibility and granularity you, you will be able to get to enforce your policies and also to get a better visibility into your reports, right? Um, it is a little bit similar when it comes to the other layers. Uh, we have the Cloud Deliver Firewall, which is uh, which gives you the ability to configure firewall outbound policies in Umbrella to be able to um, restrict what users can, can access um, when your traffic is traversing the IPsec tunnel configured, configured with Umbrella, right? And we support different uh, basically different devices uh, through this in integration. And then uh, we have, uh, on the very right-hand side, we have the Secure Web Gateway, which allows you to enforce web policies. There are a lot of features within web policies that you can do, uh, like uh, HTTPS inspection, file analysis, advanced application controls, and a lot of things that you will be able to see on, on the upcoming uh, slides. Um, and for this one, there are different deployment methods that you can uh, implement, like any connect for roaming users when they are off network. The same IPsec tunnels for the cloud delivery firewall can be used to enforce your, your web policies. Um, there is also the option to use hosted pack files and proxy chaining for those situations where you have a on-prem proxy, right? All of this, um, when, when you use the, the, um, the SIG functionalities, the umbrella outbound IP addresses, what will be seen as egress IPs when your traffic, when your web traffic is sent for the umbrella uh, deployment. We'll be talking a little bit about each of this um, that I just mentioned. The first one is the AnyConnect. Basically, the AnyConnect, uh, the main intention of using any the umbrella module within the AnyConnect is to be able to enforce DNS and web protection to your roaming users, right? Um, you can use it for both, either when they are on or off network, right? And uh, the same module has the capability to redirect DNS and web traffic. Uh, web traffic is a, a optional method or a optional feature that you can activate. We have uh, the option to activate it um, manually or for each machine or, or globally when you're ready to start deploying the web redirection for, for all users. 
Um, and this is basically a communication that happens between the umbrella module uh, with, with the profile on it uh, after the synchronization takes place. And then DNS and web traffic is sent to umbrella for DNS and web policy enforcement. And um, one of the benefits of AnyConnect is also the identity that it gives uh, when it comes to enforcing policies or reviewing your reports. If you have Active Directory integration, you're able to have not only the roaming computer name, but also the Active Directory username in your reports, which, give, which uh, gives you that uh, flexibility uh, when it comes to building your policies, right? Or doing exceptions at the user level. Um, the other deployment method is the IPsec tunnel, which as you were able to see on the first slide, uh, basically this is the only deployment method at this time that provides you with the ability to uh, enforce your cloud delivered firewall policies, um, which contains uh, layer three, layer four, or even layer seven enforcement uh, at the time that you perform the access controls. Um, through this IPsec tunnel, as I mentioned, you can forward port 80, 443, or if you want to enforce other type of uh, protection to layer three through seven, then you can also create your policies. The way that it works is that you're able to build a IPsec tunnel and you select your closest data center, right? In this example, we have uh, LA as my pri as your primary data center and Umbrella has a auto failover method, which if uh, for whatever reason, we have a situation with the LA data center, then your tunnel will auto failover to the, to the, um, to the other data center, which it would be in this case, Santa Clara, right? And then uh, it will automatically take place. So you can make sure that you have redundancy in place uh, by having just that tunnel built. Um, and then when it comes to identities, the by default, you will get the VPN tunnel that has been established as the identity. So you could tell, I want to force this policy to all traffic coming through the IPsec tunnel to this IPsec tunnel. Um, by default, it will also give us visibility to the internal subnet. Uh, so you can build your tunnels based on internal subnets um, in case you have that segregated through VLANs and then um, you want to enforce po different policies based on the uh, subnet that the users belong to, you can do so too. But if you want to get, get um, more visibility or better visibility all, all the way down to a user, you can also do that within within by using the IPsec tunnel method by uh, doing an extra step of implementing, of implementing SAML authentication, uh, that is gonna give you that extra layer of visibility as well. Okay. The other one we have, uh, as we were talking earlier, is the PAC file. The PAC file uh, gives you the ability to redirect traffic to Umbrella as well, as, as, as I mentioned. Uh, the only difference between the PAC file is that this is a, from what you might, you already familiar with is that this is a hosted pack file, which means it's a pack file on the cloud in the cloud that, when uh, implemented, you're able to do changes in the Umbrella dashboard that will take effect to all the devices that have been deployed with the pack file. There are a few uh, restrictions or, or requirements that you need to take into consideration, like the pack file is required to be on on. Um, behind a network that has been registered with an umbrella, right? And, um, and, and so you, you can make sure that the PAC file can be downloaded and deployed, and then the policies can be enforced. The When it comes to identity, the since the PAC file is intended to redirect web traffic to umbrella, browser traffic mainly, web browser traffic, um, when the redirection takes place, it does not add any additional attribution. So it means that what we will see is just the public IP address where this traffic is coming from. But if you want to have additional visibility, uh, similar to the tunnels, you can also configure SAML integration to get user visibility, right? And the last but not least, it would be proxy chaining. This one is mainly when to be used when you have a on-prem proxy already, like a WSA, for example. Um, and then you don't want to enforce uh, or you want to migrate, let's say, the enforcement that you have on your WSA, in this case, um, and you want to enforce now your web policies in Umbrella, 
what you could do is configure your WSA to redirect web traffic to Umbrella. And then um, basically the WSA will be responsible of redirecting this traffic and the policies that will be placed in Umbrella uh, are gonna be the ones taking effect. Um, and then you just need to make sure that um, there are a few settings in place um, when it comes to uh, the integration between the, the WSA and Umbrella for this functionality to, to take effect. And when it comes to identities, it's, um, there, there is a little bit more uh, visibility compared to Backfile. This one gives you visibility to the public IP address where the web traffic is aggressing from. You can also have visibility into the internal network. And, and also in this case, if, if you want to have extra visibility like user, you can uh, also leverage the SAML integration um, for this type of deployment. This is a high level uh, diagram. So you can see the deploy all deployments type from uh, on a single topology and also the how the traffic flows through the Umbrella infrastructure to be able to enforce your policies, right? So on the top, when it comes to tunnels, which is the first square here, uh, where you see the machines and, and some other devices. Uh, as you can see, this this is uh, end user traffic traversing the tunnel. And the first um, enforcement that is gonna take effect is gonna be the firewall policies, right? Uh, if it is non-web traffic, then it it's gonna enforce the policies. Uh, if the traffic is allowed or not, if the traffic is, is blocked, so of course it's, it will be dropped. If it is allowed, then what is going to happen is that it's going to go through our NAT, uh, our, our NAT statements. And uh, when that traffic is aggressing to uh, the internet, to its final destination, it will be aggressing um, with the public IP addresses with the umbrella infrastructure. Um, we have a feature that is also, um, uh, that you can leverage, that you can have, get your, your a, a reserved IP address, right? In case you want to have your own IP address and not not use uh, the let's say the the one from the pool that we have by default, you can leverage that option. If it is web traffic, uh, then it will that traffic will go through SWG, which means web policies, and within the web within the web policies, you can configure different um, different settings like enforce RBI um, or DLP, right? or just regular uh, web policy enforcement. And that once the web policies are enforced, then uh, you can either allow, block, display, war page, right? Or the different things that you're able to do within the web policies. And then um, that's through the tunnel. If, you, if it is something else that's not through the tunnel, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, like any connect, pack file, or proxy chaining, those are um, the traffic, since it is just web traffic going directly to the umbrella infrastructure, that would be traffic going directly to SWG and then get web policies enforced, right? Then this section here on the right-hand side uh, that's, that is called outbound CASB is a feature that we have called um, basically cloud malware. That is a little bit different. As you can see, it has no dependencies on, on in, inbound or inline traffic, we are, it's not inline because this uh, enforcement takes place via APIs, which means we do a API integration between Umbrella and the supported platforms, which are the ones that you see listed here on the right-hand side. And via APIs and the privileges that it provides to Umbrella, then we're able to scan files within those platforms to see if there is any malicious files, notify it, notified you as the admin within the Umbrella dashboard so you can take actions uh, on it in case you want to print time, delete, or the different options that we, that we can have depending on the capabilities that each of these platforms provide provides uh, through the APIs, right? This is a, a, um, a um, high-level overview as well on how policies are enforced. Um, basically, the first is when you enforce all these layers of protection, the, the way that it works is, as you can see, from left to the right. So if traffic is allowed at the DNS level, and then is, uh, you also have IPsec tunnels enforced, then cloud delivery firewall policies will be enforced. 
if that traffic is allowed in in web and it is web traffic then you will get your web policies enforced um to be allowed or allowed blocked or or warned or depending on the settings that you have in place and then we have this out of band option which is the one that i mentioned earlier that you can use the casby uh option for either inline when it comes to for example dlp or or the out of band option when it comes to the uh when it comes to the the uh, cloud malware or the, the new available option that we have to do out of band DLP enforcement too, right? Moving to the next one, which uh, we will be stock, start talking about uh, best practices, right? For policy, and this one is mainly for policies. The first one is that um, when when you're implementing your or configuring your umbrella web, web policies. Uh, and we need to apply different form enforcement based on location or or let's say when you start building your policies um, based on Active Directory groups or Active, or Active Directory users or subnets, then there are, um, you're able to apply different settings like HTTPS inspection, tenant controls, right? File type controls, SAML login. Um, so whenever you have the need to enforce different settings um, of this type, to the to to different group of users, subnets, or tunnels, then it is time to to build a new web policy, right? So these are basically the settings that you have within it. Then um, rules and rule sets are are, much, are matched based on um, three conditions, which means the three conditions need need to be matched in order to enforce the action, right? In this case, we will review identities. The destination where the using is the user is trying to go and schedule if configured right so those three need to match in order for the rule action to take effect if not a if not if if uh, if you match the identity but not the destination then we will check the the next rule within the configuration here is a screenshot so you can see and, and maybe better understand how um the sections within how each section um, is is basically matched within the rule or within the policy, right? As you can see here, this uh, rule set is configured with some um, rule set settings in place. Here we are mainly referring to the identity. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, selecting a tunnel as a identity. Um, and then for the rules to be enforced, as you can see, there need to need to be kind of a, a uh, and a logical and between the identity that was selected on the rule set setting, and then what the identity was selected within the rule, right? So in this case, as you can see, there is a exception on the first rule, which um, there is a Active Directory group, group selected as the identity. So most unlikely, what the user is trying to do here is do an exception for users matching the first rule so they can go to a specific destination that also the, the other users that are matching the second rule are not able to go, right? And as, as I mentioned, uh, the three uh, conditions need to match, right? So that means that for the um, exception to take effect, the user needs to belong to the AD group that is specified within the first rule and need to be going to that specific destination that has been specified within the destination list on the right hand side. Uh, if the user within that AD group is trying to go to other destination that is not the one uh, that was configured on the destination list on the first rule, then they will end up matching the second rule and will be denied to go anywhere else uh, within the categories that are uh, configured within the second rule, right? So this is how your um, rule sets will look like, and there are a lot of things you can do within it. Um, always thinking into consideration how rules uh, take effect. When identities, uh, we continue with the best practices for policies. Basically, when identities are enforced web policies, we need to make sure that the intelligent proxy within the DNS policies um, basically is, is disabled. Um, the reason for that is because uh, since we are using the full proxy already as part of the, your six subscription, we don't want overlapping uh, to take to 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 be happening between the intelligent or selective proxy and the full proxy. 
at the end of the day, you already have a, a full proxy in place, so we don't really need to be uh, the intelligent proxy to be take, to be um, taking traffic, right, or selecting traffic thread. Then um, HTTPS inspection is always uh, highly recommended to be enabled uh, for you to be able to enforce the advanced functionalities within the web policies, right? Um, there are a lot of uh, features that require HTTPS inspection to be in place, like advanced application for controls, file analysis, um, the um, tenant controls, right? So that's why we recommend HTTPS inspection to be used. Of course, if you don't want to enable it since the very beginning, uh, you can start with this to block traffic only, right? Which uh, will give you the, the option to at least display the umbrella block page and then move into the uh, enabling HTTPS inspection completely. Um, then when you have HTTPS inspection, we also have the ability to configure uh, exceptions for traffic that you don't want to decrypt. Some use cases that we have uh, that are that are common why you want to do this, certificate pinning, excluding, uh, excluding non-browser uh, apps that user use user aging string. So that make them look like browser traffic when, when they're actually not, and that causes SAML to be triggered when you have SAML enabled. And then uh, development uh, applications that use uh, a separate certificate store that were if, if, if it doesn't that does not contain the umbrella certificate on it, right? So they end up triggering a error saying that they don't trust on the certificate that is being presented, of course, because umbrella is decrypting the traffic in the middle. Then this one is re related to uncategorized uh, categories. We have a category called uncategorized, and that is available for you to use it within your policies. Uh, we recommend to use, let's say, a one, one page and remote browser isolation for this type of destinations. The way that uh, uncategorized category is, is applied or enforced is uh, when a category cannot be given to a, a destination. And basically, the way that it works is that if you're trying to go to a URL and that URL um, is already categorized, as you can see here, it's going to be giving a sports. But if we don't find a categorization for the URL, we will try to give a category to the domain at least, right? If that if if that domain does not have a category, then there is how the um, that destination the user is trying to go and ends up being uh, matched or um, let's say um, determined as a uncategorized destination. And this is a screenshot of the section where you can just enable the uncategorized. Uh, category. To continue with policies, there is a feature called uh, Office 365 compatibility mode. There is a list of domains and URLs that Microsoft recommends to bypass from decryption to make sure they have a proper, fun proper functionality. So through APIs, Umbrella uh, continu continuously monitor, monitor or, or review this list of uh, URLs or IP address ranges to make sure that uh, we do not uh, affect any of those services. It's highly recommended to activate this feature um, to make sure that uh, there is no compatibility issues and it is um, very, very beneficial because you don't need to give a manual maintenance to domains that Microsoft recommends to be bypassed. Um, now we also have the protected fi uh, file bypass option. This feature is now not only available globally, but you can also enable it within within the rules. Which means if you need to do a um, if you if you want to bypass um, pro protected file from being blocked, because by default Umbrella will block those files if you have file inspection enabled, because we are not able to um, to open them or decrypt them then we will take the security approach of blocking them, but you can do the exception of allowing those files either globally or per the rule, uh, within the rule configuration. Or if you wanna do something very specific to a, just a specific file hosted on a specific destination at the URL level, then you can also create a destination list with the specified URL with the allow action set to override security for it. 
Um, here we have uh, some best practices for, for the AnyConnect. Um, we highly recommend, uh, as I mentioned initially, you have the option to uh, selectively enable SWG, which is web traffic redirection um, to specific machines, or you can do it globally. We recommend to do it on a specific machines by manually activating the feature so you can test on a few or a handful of machines first uh, before you proceed to activate this globally. And then once you have this enabled globally, you can also uh, use this same feature to disable SWG for a specific machines if needed. And uh, for now, we also recommend using or leveraging the tag tagging option that we have to uh, to group those computers that have been enabled with SWG. That way you can quickly uh, search by those machines that have been enabled with the feature, right? In case you need to take any actions on them. Um, for now, the the minimum recommended version for any connected WG deployments is for the 10 MR3. Also, um, we have in our documentation, which are the recommended umbrella networks uh, or IP addresses that the AnyConnect will use to do the synchronization or traffic redirection. So we highly recommend to check that uh, network requirements are um, properly set up or configured in your network to allow the, the proper uh, in synchronization and redirection to Umbrella. Um, and also we have a feature called, um, a feature that you can configure, right? It is called domain management within the Umbrella dashboard. Uh, where you can find internal and external domains. This feature is leveraged to bypass traffic from being sent to Umbrella, right? So in case you need to bypass traffic from being sent to Umbrella, it, either because uh, it is a bandwidth intensive application or you have IP restrictions for those um, business applications, then you can bypass this traffic from being sent to Umbrella completely. That way you will avoid traffic destinated to those applications to be to be aggressing from our uh, ranges, right? Um, there are also some features that you can use as part of the uh, AnyConnect umbrella module in, 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 in situations where you, when you want to specify in a specific behavior on how you want, want it to behave when on network. So you can use either trusted network detection um, when, when to, to determine if you want the any connect to remain active uh, when behind a yes specific IP address or when behind the umbrella virtual appliance or even when there is a domain, right? Um, there is a domain that you want to use to activate this feature to tell the any connect go to standby while you're behind my network. There is the um, we also recommend to use the um, these features like activate Active Directory integration so you can have user visibility. Even when users are off network, you will be able to get this visibility in your reports and your policies. And then the lockdown mode feature, this one allow you to um, lock the umbrella services within the machine so users do not stop the service. Uh, that is regularly um, used when someone wants to stop enforcing DNS or web in, uh, policy policy enforcement in Umbrella, this one will help that from, 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 from being avoided, right? Um, and then we have this one for, uh, we are moving here for best practices for tunnels. Um, in case um, you want to enable greater throughput, right? When, when you're already configuring your tunnels, you can bypass Umbrella's uh, subnets from the tunnel to avoid users, any connect SWG users actively sending web traffic to Umbrella. They will always send traffic to these two subnets that are highlighted on this section. So by bypassing this or exempting this traffic from being sent through the tunnel, you can save uh, some um, bandwidth and, and, uh, and make sure that traffic that is uh, redirected to Umbrella by the AnyConnect is, is not uh, is bypassed from the tunnel, right? And just a highlight is that uh, there is within those two subnets, so there is a specific IP address that is used for SAML authentication. So you need to make sure that that IP address is added 
uh, or is included when when traffic is going through the tunnel to avoid um, um, or to make sure that SAML is triggered properly. And then, um, of course, review or configure our documentation to make sure you are using the the supported VPN security parameters, right? And then uh, for Meraki uh, MX, now it introduced or some time ago the support for the Umbrella SD1 connector, which means you're able to configure tunnels from the Meraki dashboard. Uh, you can quickly set up tunnels and and uh, without having to do uh, manual steps, it will quickly allow you to set up tunnels for for multiple Meraki MXs, right? And it will also allow you to leverage the auto failover methods within the Umbrella infrastructure, right? And uh, so it's it's a really good method to implement tunnels with Meraki MXs. Um, and then the the other best practice for tunnels is that due to potential rate limit rate limiting issues that we have seen when using virtual appliances and sending the DNS traffic that the virtual appliances generate inside the tunnels, is recommended to steer this traffic out of the tunnel if you're using VAs. So basically, um, the main reason for that is because VAs do not do any DNS catching, right? So they they will continue to send all these DNS queries to Umbrella directly. So it's basically, it's recommended to buy to exempt this traffic from being sent through the tunnel. And then um, the other recommendation here is that the CDFW expects just uh, expects a private RFC 1980 addresses as source IP for album packets. So if you use a non RFC 1918 addresses, you can add them to the uh, a section that is within the Umbrella dashboard when you're setting up your tunnels, you can um, add them on that section to so Umbrella can expect this type of traffic uh, as sourced and sent through the tunnel. And then um, the other best practice for tunnels is um, basically make sure ASA version 19.17 and FTD versions 17.1 uh, the reason for that is because those two versions support IV2 FQDN identity and can be used for creation for, for tunnels, right? So it gives you uh, that benefit. And um, for this configuration to be enforced, you just need to make sure that uh, you use this command of identity email ID, uh, since that's how you are able to tell uh, the ASA when you set up the tunnel, okay, use this ID when you're setting up this, the configuration of the tunnel, since this is what it will be used, the identity. And we highly recommend to use this uh, documentation, which has uh, some details in regards to ASA and FTD compatibility for the latest version. Um, and then the other recommendation is to use a unique set of uh, network tunnel credentials for each IPsec tunnels. Um, since this is going to help avoiding outages uh, when when the failover of the tunnels take effect. And the reason for that is because we support a uh, single identity per, per a single ID identity um, per tunnel per data center. Right? And uh, the other best practice for tunnel is um, exclude, exclusion of web traffic. Right, you're able to um, exclude traffic that uh, you don't want to send to Umbrella. Right, you're able to configure via PBR or uh, route, um, either policy-based routing or, or route-based option. Basically, in this case, we recommend to use PBR for ISR or ASA. In this case, to exclude traffic from being sent to to Umbrella. There, uh, depending on the platform you're using, each of them have a uh, a method to configure these exclusions. Like uh, ISR or ASA, you can use route based and to conf and configure the exclusions via PBR. Uh, Firepower has the option as well after 6.7 or above to do this configuration via PBR. Um, Meraki MX. Have the you can use the non-Meraki peer. Um, 
now it has been introduced. It has recently been introduced for non Meraki VPN peer. Um, so you can bypass traffic or the SD1 connector. They now support the VPN local breakdown too. And for third, third party devices, it's of course depends on the routing and VPN capabilities of, of the vendor. And here I'm going to be passing the, the ball to Eduardo so he can continue to explain a little bit more about the best practices and then the upcoming uh, troubleshooting details. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ilda. So, <clears throat> continuing with the best practices for the tunnels, you can um, configure, well, if, if you enable the SAML authentication for the VPN tunnels and you don't want to uh, provide the authentication or ask for authentication to a specific networks over the tunnel, you can configure this specific um, networks as part of the internal network bypass functionality for the SAML configuration, so, so they will not be triggered for SAML uh, when they go through a specific tunnel. <clears throat> and this is important, you can uh, use it to bypass authentication for a specific servers that you don't want to trigger for authentication, all devices that are not managed. <clears throat> then if you would like to um, to, to have internal IP address uh, visibility when you have um, uh, when when you have um, the uh, proxy chaining configuration, you can configure the XFF header, and this will also uh, help you provide this functionality that you use for the VPN tunnels. No, nope, you have to go back. Yeah. Um, for the VP, as a VPN tunnels, so you can bypass the authentication, uh, adding the internal IP address that you're seeing through the XFF header information on proxy chaining, so you bypass the SAML configuration for them. <clears throat> and then uh, if you have overlapping networks, uh, you can also add the internal IP addresses and configure policies to the different overlapping networks that you may have over the tunnels, just assigning them to different umbrella sites and assign them then to the to the specific tunnels, and you can create policies to them. Okay, next slide, please. Then we're going to move to the best practices for the AD connector. <clears throat> so one functionality that it is important uh, that uh, not everyone configures is this selective synchronization. And this is going to allow the uh, administrator to uh, select a specific groups that you and users that you would like to synchronize to the umbrella cloud. So not all the uh, users and groups will be uploaded to the umbrella portal. So you can just specify the ones that you would like to see and apply policies to. <clears throat> Then another configuration uh, that is important for the AD connector, especially when you are um, authenticating via the AD connector, is to add the users that are service accounts into this configuration in the portal. So the AD connector will uh, bypass or ignore these events for the service accounts and they don't introduce any noise into the authentication process. Next slide, please. <clears throat> when we implement uh, authentication with Azure AD and Okta provisioning, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, used to provision the users when you don't, you don't want to install or you don't require to install an AD connector. So you can synchronize your users and groups using SIMP from Azure, and then you're gonna ha you can apply policies to the users <clears throat> on the portal uh, based on this identity synchronized from Azure. <clears throat> it, when you do this uh, this implementation, it is important to understand that um, it only applies for uh, authentication for the uh, AnyConnect uh, clients and for SAML configurations. If you have virtual appliances this will not work for the virtual appliances. For the virtual appliances, you still need to have an AD connector installed on the network. 
Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as as we were saying for the AnyConnect, um, we recommend installing the latest versions because there are some known uh, problems on the older versions. Uh, so we always recommend to use at least what it is available on Cisco.com. And here's one of the problems or uh, compatibility issues that we uh, have seen on the AnyConnect, the umbrella module is when you have captive portals. <clears throat> and this has been resolved on AnyConnect for that 10 MR5. So if you run into captive portal problems, you, you may probably need to uh, upgrade the AnyConnect. <clears throat> Um, then another uh, configuration that it is important to understand is when you have a deployment that has any connect and VPN tunnels in place, then if you add something to the any connect client to the external domains, that traffic is still going to flow through the VPN tunnel because the external domain configuration does not apply for the traffic behind a tunnel. So you will need to bypass the traffic or the domain from the external domains as well as from the VPN tunnel. So you will need to add the configuration to the VPN tunnel with the configuration options that uh, Ivan was explained before. <clears throat> uh, then uh, when you have a mixed environment between the AnyConnect and PAC files, then uh, it is important to understand that the PAC file will take precedence for the redirection over the traffic that it is generated from, from a brow web browser. So <clears throat> the PAC file identity will be applied uh, will be applied on the policy and it will be uh, showing the reporting as a PAC file and not as an any connect. Okay, uh, when we, uh, some considerations for the tunnels, uh, when we establish a VPN tunnel, <clears throat> when a third party device, or especially with ASAs or FTDs that are running one of the old versions that do not support the uh, FQDN capability to establish the VPN tunnels, um, we need to um, make sure we understand that it will use the public IP address as the IC ID. So it can only establish one VPN tunnel per data center region. Uh, it does not support multiple uh, VPN tunnels for that device from the same public IP address, unless that we use one of the newer versions with the FQDN support. <clears throat> Another uh, consideration for the tunnel is that uh, it, it has a limit of 250 megabits per second. Um, so if you required more bandwidth than that, you can establish multiple VPN tunnels uh, to different data center regions. And if you want to establish it to the same data center region, then you will need to make sure you use um, those functionalities that we were discussing before, like the FQDN to establish the VPN tunnel. <clears throat> and then by default, the six subscriptions have a fixed number of 50 tunnels for each org ID, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be increased. Uh, if you need more than 50 tunnels, you can open a support ticket and this will be uh, added into your portal. We just need to take into consideration the amount of tunnels that you're gonna add to each data center so we can plan ahead on our data, on our data centers. Okay, then uh, when we're implementing uh, Meraki um, SD1 deployments, <clears throat> Uh, new deployments for SD1, were, well, when you start a configuration, you only have one Meraki SD1, but as you add more networks, you're going to have more deployments uh, of SD1 connectors available because we have um, a limit of 20 networks per SD1 deployment that you can connect to that SD1 deployment. So um, you can have up to 20 SD1 deployments for uh, your uh, Meraki org, and that will mean you can connect up to 400 networks with the current um, um, SD1, deploy uh, SD1 configuration for Meraki. <clears throat> now, one uh, thing to understand with the Meraki SD1 deployment is that it can handle up to 250 megabits per second, and this bandwidth is going to be shared 
uh, between the different networks that you have connected to this SD1 connector. <clears throat> and uh, then we have uh, consider an important consideration for SD1 is that when you're uh, bypassing the traffic, this is limited to destination IP and ports. Unless you have an SD1 license, you're going to have more options to bypass or exclude the traffic from the VPN tunnels, and you can do it by domain and application. And this is this only applies for destination traffic. It does not apply for uh, source traffic exceptions at the moment. Some considerations when you have Okta AD and um, Azure AD provisioning is that you cannot mix or have the same identities from two different sources. Like if you have Azure or um, the AD connector, you need to make sure that the identities are, um, are not shared between the different synchronizations. To avoid this problem, we have the selective sync that you can configure for Azure or for the AD connector as we uh, explained before. There is no limitation for the number of users that you can synchronize from uh, Azure or Okta, but we do have a limit of 200 groups that can be synchronized from uh, these functionalities. <clears throat> And then, of course, Okta uh, and Azure authentication cannot be integrated with the virtual appliances at the moment. Then we start with the troubleshooting section. <clears throat> and um, the initial troubleshooting that we can do is we can go to welcome.umbrella.com. And that way, we can verify if the computer is being protected by Umbrella or, or not. And then we can verify this NS lookup for a debug that opened DNS that will provide all this information that we have highlighted here. Uh, so we we try to specify what it what uh, each line means. So you can take a look at, at this later in case that you need this information. Then another important tool is the policy debug that check umbrella.com. This is a website that you can use to verify. Uh, which policy or which rule set is been matched for SWG. So you can see that link on the middle of the page um, that is redirecting you to the umbrella dashboard. If you click on that link, it's going to open the exact policy and rule set that it has been matched uh, for this specific user. <clears throat> then this policy the policy debug that check umbrella, it's also used to identify if the traffic is being redirected by SWG. So you can see an SWG location or DC node here. So we know that this user is using SWG. If we don't see this information, then it means that the user is not using SWG just by taking a look at this policy debug. Next page, next page please. <clears throat> then we also have the policy tester. We have the policy tester for the DNS policy, but we also have a policy tester for SWG that you can use to test your policy ahead of time or verify what's going to be the final decision for uh, your policy for specific websites um, and for a specific uh, identities uh, from the portal. <clears throat> then, uh, since we're using AnyConnect, we're always going to have the Dart bundle available. And this will be uh, used for uh, specific scenarios that are related to the AnyConnect, like re registration process, problems, synchronization problems, uh, problems related to trusted network detection, that it is not detecting that it is in an internal network, um, and um, related to uh, the exception list, like the internal or exter external domains, if they are not being bypassed. Then uh, for the troubleshooting on, of SWG, since we're handling websites, then we're, of course, going to have a hard file available to collect and investigate possible problems related to the websites not loading correctly, uh, parts of the page not loading correctly, or something failing on the website so we can um, verify it on a hard file. And then we have these HTTPS codes here that are important 
uh, when we're uh, troubleshooting things with uh, Umbrella Seek. Then when we have SAML, um, we have this SAML cookie. Uh, so you can just go into this URL and it will show you if there is a cookie present on that web browser or not. So that way you can identify if the user was authenticated previously or not. Then when we're handling problems with uh, SAML, you can install the SAML tracer uh, on your web browser. So you can take a look at the transactions done by SAML and verify if there are any problems with your IDP or with the SAML configuration in Umbrella. Then we also have the SLG diagnostic client that can be used to collect hard files to compare the latency between SWG and direct internet access. And then it will also download the SLG config file as part of the uh, information that we'll collect on the computer. So you can use it to compare it and collect information. And this can be found on, on, uh, on Cisco.com software download. <clears throat> when you're uh, looking at the reports in the activity search, a uh, good troubleshooting tip is you can uh, filter it with the um, uh, with the all requests drop down. If you want to see like DNS or web traffic or just firewall logs, you can filter it just by those specific logs. And then if you want to show more information on the columns, you can customize the columns as well. And then one column specifically that we we'll, we'll, uh, like to add is the policy rule value. So you can see what is the exact rule within the rule set that was matched by this traffic, because you can have a long list of rules that, that can be configured on that rule set. All right, so we get to the demo section and then we're gonna continue with my uh, friend Luis here that it is gonna show the, the, the demo. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just please provide all the privileges to Luis so he's able to share this demonstration. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hilda. So uh, I see that you guys can see my, uh, my desktop. So I'm sharing the umbrella dashboard. And as you can see, this is the overview of uh, all our deployment in this case, as you can see, you can see a summary of the health of the deployment. Uh, in this specific case, I just have, a, as you can see, an, well, an active network and one active tunnel. Something really you know, interesting about this section is that you can actually click on any of these sections and it will uh, redirect you directly to well, the place where you can uh, find more details about these networks or uh, of the, these tunnels. So uh, we'll be clicking on those uh, in a couple of seconds. But as you can see, we can also see a breakdown of, of uh, you know, the network status, how many, to let's say, total requests we're seeing in the, uh, in the environment, how many blocks, how many security blocks. In this case, we don't have any in this, uh, let's say, um, uh, demo environment. Also, we can see the breakdown of the firewall, uh, you know, sessions and also blocks. So uh, you can see the summary, if we have the IPS feature, and this will be something that we'll be covering in future events. So hopefully you can join uh, all those specific events. And of course, uh, some data in regards to, as you can see, malware, phishing, blog, command and control. So here we can see, uh, well, this, this kind of summary between DNS and also web policy. So definitely uh, very, very useful, uh, you know, to see, well, this will be like the landing page when you would like to, uh, you know, see what's going on with your environment. Of course, we have the message section here at the top, and you can see some uh, important messages uh, in regards to, uh, you know, new features that we're adding or features that we're uh, removing. So definitely very, very useful. Uh, so I'm just gonna click here in active networks. And as you can see, well, I have one uh, active network for my DNS policy, and as you can see, it is active. So that means that we're constantly uh, sending traffic and you can see also, uh, for example, my public IP. But in regards to, uh, uh, well, SIG, that is why we are here, you can, uh, you might need to come here to Network Tunnel, and you can see that I have an FTD uh, device. So uh, in this case, the topology that I have is very, very simple. So I have, um, well, a PC that is behind an FTD. In this case, the FTD is running version 6.7, uh, 
Uh, as you noticed, and as part of the presentation, we're suggesting to run something higher than 7.1 to take advantage of all the latest features that a VPN is, uh, you know, including. And of course, uh, we're going to be releasing soon 7.3, and uh, we are adding multiple and new features in regards to VPN, like Lookback and some other ones. So uh, please stay tuned to version 7.3 on the FTD side. Um, we 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 can see you know additional details in this case. Since I'm using version six that seven, I have to use the tunnel ID of the IP address. But as uh, uh, as we saw in the presentation, we now can use an um, email address or a string when you're creating the tunnel. So definitely, that's very very convenient. As you can see at the top, we can see a summary of all the uh, the active tunnels and also the data centers that we're using. I'm connecting directly to Miami. So uh, this is uh, well the closest data center that I had, the one that I picked. Uh, so you can definitely um, we'll see more or additional uh, you know information in regards to to this tunnel. If I click here in the uh, well to display more details in regards to the tunnel, well you can see that I can update the tunnel ID, I can update the passphrase that I initially uh, defined, and also I can see uh, you know some network statistics at the top. Uh, sorry, at the bottom. So you can see how many packets I have sent, how many bytes, and also uh, from the output perspective, how many uh, you know packets I have sent, if, and if there's any um, uh, you know any timeouts or idle timeout there. So uh, also, uh, well, I saw a chat in the uh, sorry a question in the chat that was asking if if we uh, have any you know troubleshooting options. So uh, you can do some uh, troubleshooting in the edge device that you have. In this case, it'll be from my FTD. But uh, you know, if, if we need some uh, you know deeper additional troubleshooting, we might need to involve in umbrella support. So just keep that in mind. Um, well, let me just uh, go to my uh, test host, and as you can see here, um, well, the public IP that I got is 155.190.20.7, and as you can see, it's part of the Cisco OpenDNS or Cisco umbrella. So the public IP that I'm using to uh, actually browse the internet on this test PC uh, is going through the tunnel and uh, I'm getting identified as part of the Cisco umbrella network in Florida, as you can see here. As Eduardo was saying, and as part of the troubleshooting, we can go to the policy debug uh, check umbrella.com. So uh, the first message that we see at the top is that we're actually using umbrella sig. So with that, you can, uh, you know, you can be sure that we're uh, actually using and being protected by Umbrella SIG. And if you would like to see more details, as uh, Eduardo was uh, was showing us, so you can see, for example, that the DC location actually matches what we have on the configuration. So it's in in Miami, and of course, we're seeing uh, different external IPs uh, at the moment. When I, uh, you know, when I refresh the page at that point, it was uh, 20.4, but. Uh, uh, in this case, but in the other one was 20.7. So uh, definitely you can compare, you know, uh, which specific public IP you're getting and also your tunnel ID, also the name of the of the device that you have defined in the dashboard. So definitely it's the same device. And uh, well, uh, this can give you the possibility to actually, you know, understand a little bit more about, uh, you know, your deployment and actually, you know, help you out throw should any, uh, you know, any additional problems that you might have. So let me go back to the dashboard so we can continue, uh, you know, uh, reviewing some additional configuration options and settings. And just in case, I'm going to go back to the network tunnels and I'm just going to give you or show you the options when you create an, a new tunnel. So here you just define a name and then you can select multiple devices from here. So as you can see, we have support for ASA, FTD, ISR, Meraki MX, Bipella, and any other device that support IPv2. So, uh, Keep that in mind. So if in this case uh, I select FTD, you see that we have two different options. Email that is the suggested one after 7.1 in FTD. And of course, I also have the IP address option. So I can define a passphrase and I can connect to uh, well, specify any, you know, any sites that I have defined. And of course, uh, as Ivan was mentioning, some uh, client reachable prefixes that we can add as part of the of the network tunnel configuration. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, in regards to the policy, so as you can see, uh, we have multiple uh, policy options and we still have our uh, good DNS policies. So, you can still create uh, policies and define uh, policies at the DNS level. But in this case, we're going to just focus on the firewall and web policies. So, uh, 
as you can see, I have uh, created uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, policies beforehand. So uh, as you can see, I ha we have multiple policies that were created here. So I created one for uh, log4j, another one that will block, uh, you know, uh, all ports to uh, an specific IP address. This one is something, you know, very important that we'll be testing today that we're going to block a specific protocols. So uh, some uh, layer seven, uh, you know, rules that we're creating at the at the firewall level. So as you can see, I'm specifying the tunnel in this case is the FTD lab uh, tunnel. And I'm specifying some, um, you know, specific applications that I would like to block. So FTP is here, uh, SNMP is here. So uh, multiple applications that we can specify here. So we can also define source IP uh, ports, destination IP, and destination ports. So that's uh, that's available there. Also, uh, well, we can define schedules. That is uh, something that uh, a lot of, a lot of our customers uh, were asking for. So definitely, we can create schedules and we can define that here. So this rule will only work at the defined schedule. We can also modify the hit counts. So uh, we can update the uh, the amount of hit counts that we see in the rule. And the, and the login options, uh, you know, based on the uh, on the parameters that you can see. Uh, the the smallest amount will be five minutes, and the uh, probably the largest one will be thirty days. We can enable or disable login for this specific rule. Probably very very important if you would like to see those specific messages um, in our in our reports. Um, so the other rule that we'll be testing today is block ICMP, and as you can see, well. In this specific rule, uh, we can define the action here. In this case, I'm just going to block. I have a specified ICMP. So, uh, um, well, that's the only protocol that we're going to block with this specific rule. And I have a specific IP address that is 4.2.2.2. And uh, we have the, well, you know, the same options that we have already discussed. So I'm going to click and cancel and I'm go. I'm going to go back to um, my uh, host. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, test the FTP role. So, uh, this was a, another test that I was running. So, as you can see, we're trying to resolve the URL, um, the FTP server that is in the internet. We have the public IP, so we know the DNS is working and we're attempting to connect. Uh, normally, and most of the times you will see that really, really fast if the, we have the username and password, uh, you know, uh, the, the right username and password, we will see, you know, the content or all the files that are uh, listed in that specific server. But at this point, we're not seeing that information. So, uh, and as you can see, we attempted to connect and we actually uh, went through the authentication process, but uh, we're, we're getting an error message that uh, we are actually not, not able to retrieve the list of all the, of all the files that are hosted there. So, and we see that the application is attempting to connect one more time. So definitely, um, you know, uh, uh, our cloud delivery firewall is blocking that traffic. Um, if you remember the the other rule that we had, um, you can see that uh, I'm going to attempt a ping to 4.2.2.2. Hopefully it's not too small. Uh, and you can see that it is timing out. Just to be sure that, uh, you know, um, I'm not doing any tricks. I'm going to ping something else, as you can see, Google.com and Google.com replies with no prompts. So uh, definitely we know that, uh, you know, DNS resolution and also IP connectivity works. So uh, uh, the other, um, you know, uh, probably what you would like to do after this is to go back to your um, to your reports and see, if, uh, you know, how this looks like. So normally what I like to do is to go to reporting and then activity search. On activity search, and Eduardo was, uh, you know, uh, talking about this, you have multiple options and we can uh, select, you know, different type of uh, filters here in the left-hand side. So what I uh, will do at this point is select block. So only the block uh, events will be displayed. I can also filter here at the top. So if I put, for example, for the two, the two, it will only uh, show me blocked uh, events that are associated with this specific IP address. So you can see that the identity in this case is my FTD lab. The rule set that I am using is specifically that one, the FTD lab um, rule set. We can see that the destination IP address is 4.2.2 .2 .2 and the internal source IP. And uh, we saw it when 
as part of the output. It was 182 at 168 at 1 at 98. We can see the action that is blocked. And we can see the application that is ICMP or ping. Of course, we see the more detail about the protocol. We see the name of the rule. So uh, we can identify the rule that is actually the same name that we created. And uh, well, we can see the time specifically for that. If you would like to uh, see more details, you can uh, you know, uh, click here where it says view details and you can see additional information about this. Um, this is a hyperlink as you can see in the name of the rule. So if we click here, it will uh, send us directly to, uh, uh, to, to the rule uh, that we created before. So uh, that's an easy way to actually see those rules. And uh, well, we, al we also blocked an additional, you know, additional traffic that was uh, FTP. So I'm gonna use the one of uh, Eduardo's suggestion that was uh, to use this drop-down uh, menu. So I'm gonna select firewall. So you will see that now I'm just gonna see blocked uh, um, events uh, and uh, that are related to firewall. So you can see that I still can see like the ping request but I right now can see um, the uh, the FTP traffic. So this is this this rule here, the second rule, and I'm gonna display additional uh, information about this specific uh, event. So uh, as you can see, we have the source IP that is exactly the same. We have the destination IP that we saw on the policy of client, destination port 21, application FTP, and uh, well, we can we know that that's TCP. So uh, this will give you like a brief overview of uh, you know uh, how can you identify uh, you know which traffic is being uh, blocked and how can you easily identify uh, you know uh, the traffic that is that has been blocked by our uh, you know solution. So going back to the policies, so uh, this covers uh, the firewall policies. If we go to the web policies, you can see that I have a well. Eventually, uh, in a in a couple of seconds, you will see that I have created multiple. Um, policies here. I have one for our uh, FTD tunnel, and this one only applies uh, for web traffic. So I have created, uh, let's say, three rules. The first one uh, will block, as, uh, as they call it right now, Google Meet. Uh, it was previ previously called Hangouts. You can see the action of the rule. The action of the rule is blocked. You can see that it is associated with my network tunnel, and I'm blocking two different applications. In this case, you can see Google Meet and Google Hangouts. So that, that will block those specific applications that we have. You can also edit the rule if you would like. You can also disable it or delete it completely. Uh, we have also created another rule that this one, uh, it will actually show us a one um, message saying that you're going to a potential a malicious uh, web page or a category that we're blocking. In this case, as you can see, I'm blocking two different categories. The first one is tobacco and the other one uh, is weapons. So uh, in this case, I'm gonna display in a warm message uh, when somebody uh, you know visits a page that it's part of this category. The other one is uh, to block applications and this is associated with app discovery and we'll be discussing this uh, later on this demo. Okay, so after we created this policy and let me go through uh, you know, this additional rule set, um, settings that we already discussed in the presentation. So as you can see, uh, this is the name of the policy or the uh, rule set name. The identity in this case, it was the tunnel that we created. We can also modify the umbrella uh, block page. You can either use the default one or you can customize um, you know, yours. Uh, we also have tenant control. So uh, if we uh, click here in the edit section, you can see that we um, can apply it some specific uh, settings in regards to Microsoft, uh, Google Suite, and also Slack. Uh, we can. We also have the possibility to apply some file file analysis, um, uh, you know, settings uh, like enable threat grid, uh, or in this case that we have rebranded rebranded this name as uh, Cloud Malware Analytics. So we were performing a file inspection. We also are performing. HTTPS inspection and decryption. And as you can see, well, uh, we're performing some exemptions and probably you would like to do something similar to this. So I'm, I'm not decrypting traffic that is associated with finance. So any bank accounts, um, will, uh, those, uh, let's say, websites won't be decrypted. You can also specify a specific uh, websites if you would like to do it. And uh, of course, uh, 
uh, you probably would like to, uh, you know, include here like health uh, related uh, websites like uh, uh, insurance or in hospital, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> sites in this case. Uh, we can also uh, decrypt only block traffic or we can disable completely um, the encryption. As you can see, we have uh, the SAML option that Eduardo was discussing uh, that option. And uh, we also uh, will have enabled some uh, security settings. In this case, we have malware, command and control, phishing, and potential harmful um, uh, sites. So uh, let me go back to my demo. And as you can see, I'm gonna inspect the certificate of this uh, you know, bank uh, website. So as you can see, the certificate is actually associated uh, with JP Morgan. So uh, you don't see any umbrella details here and it even if i go a little bit deeper you see that it's actually the bank's um certificate here i'm gonna go to another website in this case it will be a face uh, well facebook if i click here and uh connection is secure and if i inspect a little bit more deeper the certificate you will see that uh the cisco umbrella certificate is being used so we're actually decrypting this web page uh so we're gonna be able to inspect what's going on in this network. So now we know that, you know, that decryption policy is working. Um, remember that we created a policy that uh, if we go to, uh, uh, you know, any website that was associated with uh, tobacco or uh, weapons, uh, we will display, uh, you know, a warn message. So this is the uh, the message that we'll be getting. Uh, and in this case, it's bad that com that is British American tobacco. It's I normally use it because it's really easy to remember, right? Uh, so I just uh, can click and continue, and it will give him the possibility, uh, you know, to continue and go to the actual website. The other rule that we created was associated with uh, Google Meet or Google Hangouts. So as you can see, I have this uh, uh, Google account, this Gmail account. If I click on Meet. Uh, in theory, it should display, you know, uh, the possibility to either send messages, chat, or start a, you know, a video call, but it, it will get stuck here in the loading and you will never uh, load. So if I go back to um, our reporting, so uh, you can, well, we can review the activity here. And sorry, just clicked additional. So. Uh, you can see that I'm gonna click on block and I'm gonna use the suggestion of web. So uh, you will see here that uh, meet.google.com has been blocked. We see that it, it was identified by the application. And uh, you, you know we see additional details about uh, this specific application. We also, um, we also uh, are gonna be able to to see, uh, you know, uh, well, and actually you can see that Google tries in many different ways to actually connect to uh, to this specific chat and, and same with the, you know, the, the other options. So uh, I think the, the takeaway here is that you need to, or the probably the best way to actually find uh, websites that are being blocked or worn, uh, you can select it here, specify the filter, and so you can see I have bad.com. So uh, you can see that this one was, uh, was worn. And uh, you can uh, use these filters in the left-hand side. Probably the last thing that I'm uh, that I'm gonna discuss, and since I know that we're uh, you know running out of time, is app discovery. This is uh, very useful, something that um, we uh, we would like you to to use. And actually, you can see that we can block um, or allow um, a specific applications based on a, you know your security policy. At the top, you will see a summary of all the applications that we have identified. In this case, 87. I have not uh, reviewed any one, any of those applications, so I, I don't have anything under audit or under approve or block. Um, you can see that we're gonna suggest some of the categories. So we have, for example, cloud storage, social networking, collaboration. You will also see based on DNS requests, uh, the risk of those specific applications. And we're also gonna uh, give you the option to uh, see, for example, uh, some uh, of these applications based on category and risk. Uh, just to uh, uh, show you one quick example before closing the demo. So uh, you can see that I have selected um, cloud storage. Uh, some of you may want to block these specific applications because we have the, the option to share a lot of information in this cloud storage applications. So we have the option to either label it 
And of course, this does not affect you know, the actual functionality of this application, but it uh, gives you the possibility to actually, uh, well, like a visual way of saying that you have already reviewed this application or not. But in order to actually uh, perform, uh, you know, uh, like control against this specific application, you can do it at the DNS level or the web level. So you can select it here. You can select that it is not approved and you, you can then click and save. So uh, after that, this specific application uh, will be uh, will, will be blocked by our app discovery, or you can also hear it uh, when we're talking about app discovery as Shadow IT. So, um, well, this is this concludes the demo. Hopefully, this was useful. And I'm uh, going back to you, Ilda. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the audience that stay with us, even though that we are a bit late on this event. But we know Umbrella has a lot of features and things. So, what I would like to ask you is, like, we have a survey actually after this event finishes. If you feel like there's some particular topic that you would like us to cover in relation with Umbrella, its features, integrations, or any other, please let us know so we can make further sessions. The idea is that we would like to focus on this topic more and provide more content so you are able to see it. Uh, so please um, feel free to, to leave that in the survey so we can create a, an upcoming session of that. Uh, we don't have any time for questions, but I saw and count randomly that you approximately answer more than 20 questions on live. So thank you very much for the experts and the audience. Uh, once again, if you have any extra question that you would like to feature, or you think about something that they mentioned along this event, please uh, feel free to upload it into this forum session. It's going to be available till next Friday. There are Eduardo, Luis, and Ivan. We'll be helping out to cover all these topics and questions. And well, uh, if you'd like to find more information about events like this, the content in the community or anything else, we invite you to have a look to our social media handles. Uh, we have Twitter, we have present in Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and if you're a customer or partner, through the Cisco technical support application in your mobile devices. Uh, also, if you speak another language rather than English, uh, feel free to visit any of the local communities that we have. These are standalone communities. Um, they have different content, all of them, and all designed for all of you. And finally, if you're looking for further IT training, please don't forget to have a look to everything that the Cisco Learning Network is offering you. There you can learn more, not only about certifications, but also about our architectures and technology that Cisco offers. Once again, thank you for your time. Please don't forget and take a moment to fill out the survey and let us know what would you like to see in upcoming events, how we are doing, and what we'd like to see in relation to Umbrella in particular. Once again, thank you everyone. Thank you to the experts and to all of you. We hope to see you soon and please enjoy the rest of what is of this year. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Van, and greetings to Costa Rica. Thank you and see you until the next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ilda. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks.